This is the Church of St. Paul in the Desert. May the words of my mouth and the meditations of our hearts be always acceptable in your sight, O God, our Rock and our Redeemer. Amen. We have two scriptures today that have a twist in them that is unusual in the scripture, at least it seems, and probably feels unusual to most people. The first is in Jeremiah. And do you remember last week's Hebrew scripture reading from Lamentations? It was pretty miserable, pretty awful. But today, Jeremiah is writing to the people who have been captured. Their land has been conquered by the Babylonians. Do you remember Nebuchadnezzar? Okay. That's the same Babylonians. And then they took the people out of Judea, which is basically the land around Jerusalem. They took, and they didn't take everybody. Sometimes you'd think that they just kind of wiped Jerusalem and Judea off the map and took them to Babylon, but that's not exactly how it went. They took the leaders, they took the religiously trained, they took the intellectuals, they took the people in power, and they took them away to Babylon. And Jeremiah, at the end of his book, is writing to those people who have been taken away in captivity in Babylon. And here's where the twist is. Because for folks who right now are used to a lot of polarization, um, frankly, we're used to polarization of everything, it seems, but the political season exacerbates it. Everything's either good or bad, or super or horrible. That's how polarized things are. Can you imagine being the leaders, the intelligentsia, the privileged of a particular culture who've been lifted up and taken away. Now some of you who've just come here and have gone through a summer in Palm Springs may feel like that right now, but it gets better. Um, those people, how would you expect people who were snatched up and taken away and given homes on a garbage dump, how do you think they'd feel? How do you think they'd act? But Jeremiah tells them, build homes and live in them. Plant gardens and eat the fruit of the land. Get married, get your children married off, have kids and thrive. Don't diminish. And make sure that you pay attention to the well-being of your neighbors. Make sure you pay attention to the well-being of those Babylonians. That's the turning point in this. Because we'd normally be trying to figure out how to be the, the resistance, you know, how to stand up against them, how to undermine, how to stop everything that they're doing. Does that sound familiar? Sometimes the polarization that we experience is such that when a decision is made and the decision didn't go our way, well, we're going to figure out some way to pout, either legislatively or personally. But this passage says, in all of your thriving, in all of your attention to your well-being, to your being fruitful, to growing and developing as a faithful people, make sure 
that you attend to the well-being of your neighbors. And then here's the kicker. Because your well-being is connected to theirs. Now, that's the message. That's a message for us Christians. But again, it didn't start with Jesus, did it? Did it? The message is back there where God is speaking to God's people who have endured being conquered, have endured all sorts of horrible things. And the prophet of God is telling them, do well, but make sure your neighbor does well too. Because your well-being, your success, your enjoyment in life is tied in with theirs. In Palm Springs, we have all sorts of ways to experience divisions, and if they don't exist, we can create polarizations. You know, we can find groups of people to be against, even if there's, even if you have to work, even if we have to work at it, we can figure that out. But the well-being of St. Paul in the desert is interconnected with and is, and is connected to the well-being of St. Margaret's and the well-being of Our Lady of Solitude and the well-being of Temple Isaiah and the well-being of the businesses on Palm Canyon and the well-being of those who find themselves homeless on our streets. Our success our well-being is dependent on lots of other people. So this, got, this reading from Jeremiah is inviting us to pay attention, to see our neighbors and to see those around us so that we can be connected, so that our well-being can really be connected to theirs and so we can look out for one another. And then we get to the gospel. And this is a gospel that if I had to bet, I'd bet most everybody here who's been to church has heard this at least once. How close am I? How many of you heard it? Oh, okay, there's, there's at least a couple hands going up. And everybody knows it as the 10 lepers. You noticed I read it differently? I read it as the 10, 10 leprous men. Well, one of the reasons is because I had the benefit of reading a translation of it that gives you all the Greek and everything else, and it was very specifically leprous men. It wasn't generic, as if one could be defined by one's disability or one particular aspect of one's life. It could just as easily, uh, we could demean any person by ignoring the fullness of their humanity and only thinking of them by one characteristic. Oh, they've got a disease that makes them really unpleasant to be around, and we've been taught that we are not able to go to worship if we've been touched by them. So that's the one characteristic that defines them. Well, frankly, I think we can look in our immediate world today and in our not very distant past and find ways in which we have demeaned whole segments of our community by only recognizing or lifting them up or putting them down based on one aspect of what makes them a full human being. Now, leprosy isn't the heart of this sermon. The heart of this sermon is what happens. Uh, this is part of the series that I think I should call Jesus Does Nothing Again. Because we've been through so many, so many gospels that we've read this year in Luke where Jesus actually doesn't do anything and the people are healed. We like the places where there's a blind person, a blind man, and Jesus spits and makes mud and sticks it in his eye. None of us want that. But we, 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 we know that. But in so many of these healings in Luke, 
Jesus does nothing. The group of leprous men cry out, Jesus, Master, have mercy on us. Well, what did that mean? Were they asking to be healed? Were they asking for what in English history we'd call for the coach and six uh, to be made among the betters of society? I would bet that if you were to ask them, they were looking for something to eat or maybe a warm place to sleep. And Jesus just tells them, ah, go show yourselves to the priests. Because the priests were the ones that could decide whether or not you could be readmitted to the worship life of the community at the time. And it says, as they went, they were healed. So do you see how I get that it's another one of those places where, headline, Jesus does nothing again. Ten healed. And as they went, they were healed. And one of them notices. One of them sees the healing, just as Jesus saw them in their wholeness as men. One of them sees this healing, and the first thing he can think to do is not to go to the priest and make sure everything's okay first. The first thing he does is turn back and say, thank you. Now, he does it in a very, you know, a very um, emotional and dramatic way, which I'm not expecting, you know, in case anybody likes the sermon and wants to thank me afterwards. You know, no prostrating yourselves on the way out of church. Um, we're not that kind of place, okay? This person, this man, thanks Jesus. Now, I can't think of the number of sermons that I've heard about this and probably even preached myself over the years where this is a way for us to shame the people who didn't give thanks. There's even a, an angle of this where because there's a slightly different word used for cleansed and healed, that we say, well, you know, the, the ten leprous men were cleansed, but only the one who gave thanks was healed, as if there's something different. That's something that preachers have invented that is not a thing in the language. It is not a real difference. The man who turned and gave thanks to Jesus responded because he saw healing and his heart caused him to give thanks. Now, I would suggest that giving thanks is the spiritual practice that could allow us to most effectively be interconnected with our community. Okay, I think there's some obvious ways. Tonight at 5 o'clock, when we go to the vigil to hear what the families have to say, to honor those who were slain, injured, to honor all of those who protect and serve, we'll be giving thanks. Last night, as we went from Palm Springs to the coroner's office in Indio, all along, all along the way, streets were blocked off with fire trucks, motorcycles. People were out carrying flags, shouting, thanking. all the way down the highway, every overpass into Indio, and to a large group of people who were there to honor the fallen in Indio. They gave thanks. Now, as a spiritual practice, giving thanks is something we can do. Giving thanks is not something that requires us to shame anybody else who doesn't do it as well as we did. I have horrible handwriting. God help you if you get a thank you note from me. You might get a thank you email or a Facebook post because I don't have to write it with my hand. Jesus was not interested in shaming leprous men. He was interested in them being healed. And he responded to the one who gave thanks because he wanted to highlight it 
for his disciples. He wanted to remind his disciples that giving thanks comes from the most unexpected places. They were in on the border of Galilee and Samaria. It was just like our border, but there are no walls or fences. And so most of that 10 were Galileans. They were his people. But Jesus points out that it was the one from on the other side of the border who returned to give thanks. We can adopt as a spiritual practice the practice of gratitude that Jesus called his disciples to by recognizing that it is often those whom we least expect who perhaps are the most stellar examples of the practices Jesus calls us to, and that we shouldn't be ashamed from where we learn how to do right by one another and by God. If we became a community that was more engaged in finding ways to give thanks than to pick nits, we could make a difference. If we were a community that was more engaged in the giving thanks that brings together than the polarization that draws us apart, our church would be a beacon to the community and our community could be a beacon to the rest of the world. So I invite you to listen to Jeremiah. Our well-being depends on that of our neighbor. And listen to Jesus. The neighbor where the example is set may be someone we least expect.